There's many ways of doing rate limiting. That's why in this video we'll cover the most popular ones and we'll not only see how they work, we'll also talk about the pros and the cons so you know which one to apply to your system. Before starting with those, a quick recap of what is rate limiting. Rate limiting is a great way to apply a constraint, a gate, a limit to your API. It can help you to avoid resource exhaustion. It can help you to avoid, uh, to suffer with attacks. It can help you to achieve some business needs. And it's basically like a first threshold that you can define on your API and something like your API gateway that will say that my API is capable of handling X number of requests in this time window. And it's something that is widely used in the most popular APIs that you use in your day-to-day. -day. If you want an in-depth video about rate limiting, you can find my video somewhere in the top. I will link it there. But now let's go to the algorithms. The leaking bucket. Imagine that you have a tap and the water is flowing into a bucket. But the force of that water, the amount of water that is coming into the bucket, it will depend, it will vary during the day. But that bucket is leaking. And it's that leak in the bucket that will allow the constant flow of water coming out of the bucket. So we can say that while the water coming into the bucket is not stable, is unpredictable, the water that is leaking is a constant flow. However, if at a given point, the bucket is full, the water will overflow. So now apply this concept into API requests. You have the requests coming into the bucket. The bucket will be in your API gateway, let's say, and the API gateway will apply rate limiting. The rate limiting will allow the leaking of requests at a constant rate. That means that the requests coming into the system will be stable and predictable and will not see a burst of requests. If eventually you get so many requests that the bucket, the size of the request that you can handle overflows, goes over the threshold, those requests will be dropped. So this allows a steady processment of the requests and eventually some requests might be dropped. So one of the advantages of this approach is that it will smoothen out the bursts of requests and that will prevent the system from overflowing. The token bucket. The idea is quite simple. If you want to go to the movies and there's different sessions for the same movie, it might still be available tickets for that session or not. So when you go in, if you are able to get a ticket for that session, you will be accepted to get into the room. However, if when you go there, the room is already full, there's no tickets available for you to come in. If you come later in the day, eventually for the next session, it might be a ticket available, so now you can go in. The same happens with this algorithm. You have a bucket full of tokens. Each token is kind of like a ticket that allows the request to go in or not. So when a new request comes in, we'll check if we still have tokens inside of the bucket. If so, the request is allowed to be processed. If the bucket is empty, now the request can be processed and will be dropped. Eventually, according to the refill time with a given frequency, the bucket will receive tokens again. So the bucket will be refilled with tokens based on the refill size. So that means that after that moment, when a new request comes in, you can grab a token and come in once again. While in this algorithm, we don't have the same constant flow of requests coming in, the same way that the leaky bucket, it's a great algorithm because it's easy to implement. It allows you to have some degree of configuration and having a, a weight uh, depending on the type of request. For example, you can define that a given type of request might mean that you consume two tokens instead of only one. And also it's great because it avoids those short bursts of requests that might happen. And by the way, in the real world, the AWS API gateway uses the token bucket algorithm for throttling. The fixed window counter. Imagine the following scenario. You have a limit of 10 requests per hour. That means that you can pick the timeline, split it into intervals of 60 minutes, one hour, and you can assign a counter to each interval. So in a given hour, you can accept 10 requests. So when a new request comes in, we'll find the time slot for that 
and inside of that time slot, for so for the counter of that hour, what we'll do is that we'll decrement the counter, and the request will be processed. If the counter is already zero, that means that we can't accept that request, and it needs to be dropped. While this approach is quite simple to implement and easy to understand, it has some problems. For example, if we have the 10 requests coming in in the first minutes of the hour, then the client will need to wait for a long time until the moment that it can perform requests again. Not only that, but this can lead to some bursts of requests near the edges of our slot. So if we have a slot that goes from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m., and near by the edge of that slot we perform the 10 requests, and in the first minutes of the next slot, next time slot, we perform the 10 requests, now we might have the 20 requests in the system at the same time, and we are not avoiding the problems that we are trying to avoid. Sliding window log is one algorithm that tries to fight those problems that we talked about the sliding window counter. The problem of handling the twice the size of the limit that you have defined near the edges of your time slot. So the sliding window log works in the following way. Imagine that you have defined that you can handle two requests per minute. That means that when you will receive a new request, you will log the timestamp of that request into a place, okay? Like a log file. When a new request comes in, what will happen is that it will check if the log size is within the limit. So if our limit is two requests per minute, we add the timestamp there and we process the request. When the third request comes in, it's over the limit, so we'll check if the timestamp of that request based on the duration that we want to accept, so we said that is two per minute, if it's acceptable. So if we add that one, the other ones are still inside of that window. And since by adding this new request, the first one would still be inside of the window, we need to reject this new request. However, when some moments after a new request comes in and we check that within the window we have less than the limit for that time window, that means that we add that, that timestamp, we process the request, and we discard the old timestamps. The advantage of this approach is that it's extremely accurate, okay? It's a rolling window that will allow you to deal with those bursts of requests. The problem is that it's hard to implement, and in terms of memory consumption, it's not pretty. So while it might be good for a low volume API, for an intensive application, the amount of data that needs to be written and searched is not ideal. The sliding window counter is an hybrid approach between the fixed window and the sliding window log. And it has the same goal. The goal of addressing that problem of the edges, of the boundaries of your windows, but also fighting the memory problems that the other approach has. So in this approach, what will happen is that each window will still have a number of requests that can go in. However, we'll still have in consideration the number of requests from the previous time frame in order to understand if we should accept it or not. So the way that it's typically approached is by using a formula for that. So let's say that we want to accept 10 requests per uh, hour. Then what we'll do is that we'll have in consideration the number of requests that were already uh, executed inside of that uh, window plus a fraction of the requests from the previous window. The advantages of this approach is that it will smooth those bursts of requests at the boundaries. It's great because it balances the efficiency and the precision of the algorithm. It's great in terms of memory usage. However, in terms of computation, it might be a bit more demanding. And since we'll be working based on a fraction of previous windows, it might not be as precise or as strict as other algorithms are. If you want an example of the use of this algorithm in the real world, you have the example of Qualflare. So as you can see, there's many differences between those algorithms. And picking one will heavily depend on the type of scenario that you are addressing, the complexity, the resources, how demanding it is, if it's 
an API that is heavily used or not. So there's many things to be considered in this decision. So for that, I will link in the description a free matrix that I will have available for you to help you out with this decision. And if you want to go back and understand the importance of having rate limiting in place, I have a video for you that you can find right here. And please let me know in the comments if there's any other type of algorithm that I should have included in this video and I didn't touch it. I would love to hear from you.